Welcome back. We've got some chatty groups here. We are pulling everybody back here. All righty, welcome back. Well, hopefully you met some new faces and shared your goals. I'm going to hand it over to Holly and she's going to introduce our first speaker. Unmute and start my video. Hi. <laughs> Alrighty, so our first speaker today is Carla Walsh, who I have known for years, and she is just about the best person in all the land, if you haven't met her or had any interaction with her. Um, Carla is a freelance writer and editor, and she is a CEO and social media consultant, a level one sommelier who balances her love of food and drink with her passion for fitness. She focuses on food, local hospitality, fitness, psychology, relationship and travel topics, and her writing has been pu published in DSM and Iowa Magazine, plus Runner's World, Better Homes and Gardens, All Recipes, and Fitness Magazines. She most recently published a list for eater.com, which is the 33 most essential places to eat in Des Moines, and two of our own on this call were included on that list, including Pie Bird Pies and Breads by Chelsea B. So, Carla, thanks for being amazing and take it away for digital media. Oh, I'm so honored to be here. Small edit. Um, I mean, I guess I can call myself a CEO, but <laughs> I uh, SEO is what I specialize in, which is search engine optimization, which is like how you get up on the Google rankings. But that eater piece was so fun to work on and the Des Moines food scene. Uh, just makes my heart sing. So thank you guys for pouring all of your love and effort into your brands and for sharing all of your hard work with the rest of our community. Uh, so Christina just shared a file in the chat and that's what we're gonna be talking about today. I'm here to overview um, how food brands can work with media. So as you see, I write for some local publications as well as some national publications. Um, after we hop off this call, I'm gonna do my daily news dispatch for eating well. So I pitch them story ideas every morning and we cover a couple of them by three o'clock every day. Um, so that, Re relates to interesting food brands, new food products, what Ina Garten is making on Instagram. Um, and then as you guys may have seen in DSM, I do a lot of coverage both online and in print um, with a distinct focus on all things lo local. So I've written and connected with a lot of you for that already. And I'm always looking for more story ideas because we literally cover stuff every single week. And uh, as you might imagine, 52 stories plus all of the print stuff each year, there's a lot of opportunities for, for your story to be told. And uh, so what I'm hoping to cover today is basically how you can kind of uh, best set yourself up for success for making that connection and uh, making your brand super media friendly. Okay, so if you have that open, you can follow along um, and feel free to hop in with any questions at any time. I hope this is more of a conversation rather than a, just me chatting. Um, so first up, uh, post often on social media and have a clear and modern website and bonus points for eye-catching images. So I know a lot of you already have this covered, but um, it's really easy to cover you if I can hop on your website or your social media and like snag an image and just credit you with the photo. And um, if I can see what you're up to, you know, like Alyssa at Sift and Sprinkle is always showing what cakes or dessert boards or, or something cool and trendy that she's trying just for fun. Show me your flops, show me your experiments, show me your successes, your customer feedback, be yourself, which I'm sure you you will hear from Emily later today is let us in. Um, so that's super helpful. And if you have an email address on there, that's also ideal, um, just as a nice way for us to make outreach. But I'm not against sliding into your DMs as long as you don't mind me doing so. <laughs> so I'm always kind of keeping an eye open. And I know that a lot of other people who do coverage uh, follow the same idea of like, we're just fans of yours too, and we want to see you succeed. So show us what you're up to. Um, along the same lines, don't be shy about introducing yourself. So I've had a few people here and some other local food brands just shoot me a Facebook message or find my email address and say, hey, 
here's who I am. Here's my brand. Like if there's ever anything you're interested in covering, or if you want to come to this event that I'm hosting, or if you want to place an order off of my menu, um, just let me know, which is super helpful. Like I, I try to keep a keen eye, but I know that some fall through the cracks and um, I want to know that you're out there and I want to know what you're working on. So, so keep in touch with people. Um, I know the register does some food and business coverage, Jim Duncan at City View, um, Axios, um, there's just many outlets here locally that, and, and local TV news too, like Megan Ruther at, um, Hello Iowa would be an awesome person. And I know that like, they have a producer that you can just email and be like, Hey, here's what I'm up to, um, build relationships with members of the media and influencers then be open about your, what makes you different, why you started this. And I know Christina helped you guys kind of set those goals. So maybe tell us a little bit about that, what your vision is for this brand as it grows. Um, but just be honest about, about your journey because that lets people in. And that's, I think, where the real connection happens. Um, in that Eater piece that I wrote, I tried to tell as many personal stories as I could, like about how Chelsea decided to start this at the start of the pandemic or Diego at Proof moved here after living in Mexico and learning how to make tortillas with his grandma and had only worked at Chipotle before. Um, like people feel connected to a food brand uh, without even meeting the people when they know your story. And I think they feel more uh, excited to invest in it when, when they feel like that is, is, there's a person behind the brand. It's not just a big conglomerate that they're buying into. This is not Nabisco. This is not, you know, something that they can get everywhere. This is a human that they are, their money, their dollars go to support. Their kids are, you know, getting dinner on the table because they decided to buy these muffins or whatever. Um, consider building a press kit, either digitally or physically. So I would say digitally would be the most important, but if you have like a, a little sample product that you love to share with potential clients, like say you make uh, cupcakes or donuts for weddings or something like that, and you have like a little kit that you give to potential couples, um, maybe you can just tuck in like a one sheeter about your business and drop that off at some, at the register's office or something like that. Um, the more that we can know about you, when you started, what your website is, where we can order from you and where we can find you, especially if you're like a pop-up based business, that is so helpful. And like how people can order, just like all of the basic points that you might need for moving us along that customer trail, right? Because that's often like a, a challenging part about the non brick and mortar businesses for us to explain of like, where can we find you? We want to support you, but um, maybe you're booked out to a specific date. That's super helpful to know too, because like, hey, we totally get it. There's only so many hours in a day, but like um, if we can say that people can start ordering November one or something like that, that's good to know. Um, showcase yourself, your team and local purveyor partners. So one, another thing I tried to do in that Eater piece and in DSM stories is show all of the connections. I like to think of the food world like a big web. Um, everybody's connecting to everybody, right? So like uh, Gusto Pizza might use sauce from this other food brand or you know, Christina uses whiskey from the Iowa Distilling Company and some of her cupcakes. Um, I love to see how collaborative Des Moines can be. And it, as an added bonus, we get to shout out another business. So Chelsea uses young ferments on her bread sometimes. And um, when we can show that, that's even more dollars staying locally, which is great to see. Um, and it also is just another differentiating, differentiating point. Um, basically, um, the fact that you and your brand exist is awesome. And it's something that we can cover in the magazine space and find some sort of an angle. But a lot of the TV news and newspaper news needs something of a hook, right? What's new? Why are we talking about this now? Um, why is this newsworthy, right? So whether it's you're teaming up with this new partner like Black and Bold and Ben and Jerry's, which is amazing. 
so excited for that ice cream. I don't know if you guys have tried it yet. I'm definitely like going to the grocery store today. Um, but the we need something newsy for that to make TV, you know, to get Jody Long to talk about it or to have it be in the register. Um, so you have a new partner, you have an event coming up, your menu changed, you're doing a box, you're going to this event, whatever that might be. You have a special, a sale, a whatever. Um, that's something that would work great for the super timely local news. Um, if you have the means, maybe choose a charity to support every so often. That's another newsworthy and great thing and another awesome way to be collaborating with the community. So maybe for one month a year, you donate 10% of proceeds. Or I've seen Holly did like a week of her farmer's market to benefit a local farm. Um, and it doesn't have to be all of your money. Maybe it's just like 5%, 10%, something like that. Um, we love to see that. Um, and don't be afraid to ask for the coverage that you seek. I, um, I am open to any and all contacts. I get hundreds of emails a day from press reps from across the world asking me to write about their brand. So uh, a welcome note from someone in Des Moines would actually be a nice highlight. Um, so if you want me to write about you, if you want another journalist to cover you, um, let us know. Um, it might not be now and you might not hear back right away, but I always keep those emails on file of like, hey, I have stories lined up for the next three months, but you hear from me at some random, you know, December time when I'm like, all right, I have a story opportunity open now, or we have this column in the print magazine, which we're planning out six months in advance, and we think that you'd be a good person for it. So that's another thing that I think is really important to keep in mind is um, not getting discouraged if you don't hear back right away. Um, as a little break between this list, I'd love to ask you guys a question. Um, what is the most intimidating part for you about working with media? You can feel free to hop in the chat or just turn your microphone on and chime in. Don't be shy. I, I'm happy to share that I, you know, a lot of, for me, since I'm not professionally trained, I get a lot of imposter syndrome mm -hmm. that, um, as since I taught myself how to bake bread, you know, like people, you know, the, the stories I tell myself in my head about, well, if someone reads this, are they going to think I'm a fake? Are they not going to think my food's good? Are they going to, you know, be like, who's this girl baking bread out of her house? So, um, you know, that, that, that can be really scary for me. Also, you know, I think sometimes asking for what you want can be a little bit intimidating. I can say in my head, well, I would love to be covered, but then actually going out and asking for it is, is sometimes different. So getting up the courage to be like, yes, like I, I do, I do want you to cover me. <laughs> I, I think it would be really fun to have a story written about me um, and not feeling afraid of asking for it. Um, and so yeah, those things can be overwhelming to me. That's such a great point. Um, I think the, the mindset that I have about this often, and Chelsea, I think we've talked a little bit about this, is that, that like the worst that can happen is you don't hear back or they just say, no, we don't have space right now, which really isn't too bad. Um, so I always think of like, you might as well, it's like me sending out a cold pitch to you know, a new brand. Like I've never written for the New York Times or something like that. So it's kind of like me reaching out to an editor and being like, hey, here's who I am. Here's what I can offer. So like, I do this too. Like I've totally been in your shoes and have been that person that's like, all right, here's my resume. Here are some clips, you know, it's basically like you guys being like, here's some photos of some recipes that I've made. Here's my menu. Here's what I can offer. Um, it can be scary, but I think it's um, one of those moments where you just kind of have to like think about, okay, I'm not really like interfering too much with their life, right? It takes 60 seconds for them to read this email. They can respond if they like to, um, but the imposter syndrome thing is very real. That take, took me a few years to be like, no, I've totally got this. And, and I also think like they can be the judge of whether they like it or not, but you're doing your best, right? And um, 
you have a lot of customers who know and love you and they can speak for you too. So I think that's another awesome thing to include maybe in your press kit and your website is customer reviews, testimonials, things like that. Um, because yours is, yours is special and nobody, especially in a thing like food, um, nobody can really say what's right or wrong, right? It's like, if, if people love it, then it's good. And, and I think that's what matters. Okay, not knowing where to start. Ooh, that's a good one. Okay, so um, I hope this list helps, but I think starting by just um, doing the groundwork first of like building the back end of your, your technology. So your website, your online ordering, whatever that, that would be possible to make it easy from a media perspective to cover you. Um, and then just building a list of your dream coverage areas. All right, I'd love to be in Food and Wine Magazine or DSM or whatever, pie in the sky to local to whatever. Build a dream list of publications that you'd love to be covered in, online, TV, magazine, whatever. And then from there, you can start building a list of, all right, who covers this topic area, right? Like um, maybe there's a specific reporter um, maybe there's just like a general like news desk email that you can reach out to, but then just figure out who that is, figure out the formula for their email. <laughs> That's what I do often when reaching out to editors if I can't find their actual email anywhere on the interwebs, but mine is very much free and available for anybody who wants it. Um, there's usually a formula if they work at a company, blah, 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 at hearst.com, first.last at meredith.com stuff like that, where you can just find their email address. And then it's just a matter of letting them know what you're up to. Um, Alyssa, I think there's a bit of fear of success sometimes, fear that I'm going to get a lot of attention, good and bad, and fear that I might get more orders than I can handle and be forced to level up. Ooh, yes. Fear is, I think, swirling around a lot in the business space, and I totally get that. Um, Attention, good and bad, have also been there and uh, have learned to sometimes stay away from the comments. Um, but I think the the attention, um, if it does bring out the haters, that is uh, them. I think unleashing their frustration or anger in a place where it's just like easy, right? I think of that often when I read. Um, say I read a story about Reed Drummond's quesadilla pizza or something. And people just go rogue of like, who cares about Reed Drummond? Did a second grader write this story? Blah, 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 which literally happened. Um, and I'm like, ouch, that really hurts. You know, like I went to school for a long time to be a writer. And like, I know this is kind of a fluffy topic, but like, that's a low blow. And then I stepped back and I was like, wow, there must be something, you know, their kid is sick they can't pay the bills this month. And this is like the easy accessible first way for them to release that anger. You know, it's like, if I can make somebody else feel worse then that makes me feel better kind of a thing. And it's kind of like, a, okay, I see you, um, that's too bad. And I cannot control the way you react to the things that I'm doing, but I can control the way that that impacts my day, right? And it's just like, well, I'm not your cup of tea, but I can't be everybody's. And that actually solves the next problem of being too booked. So like, if you don't want to order from me, there's plenty of people who do. Um, and then in terms of the more orders than you can handle, um, I, I feel that as my own boss of like having too many stories to do sometimes. And then it's at that point where, where like many of you have done, I'm booked out until XYZ. So like right now I'm like, I can take on new stories starting in mid-October with a due date from there and moving forward. And if you don't want to wait that long, feel free to assign it to someone else. Um, or if you would like to pay a rush fee, I'd be happy to finish that earlier for an extra X dollars, you know? So there's ways that you can kind of um, adjust that either way that sits well with you. Um, but I think that when you get more orders than than you feel like you can handle. It's more about keeping yourself sane, keeping your quality in check and uh, being okay to let people wait. I think that supply and demand is a, a great thing. And like Pybirds has shown us, like people will wait, they will show up 
we communicate when we're available and uh, it all almost makes you more excited, right? Like I've read many stories about uh, the mental health benefits that you get from a vacation are good while you're doing the vacation, right? But the max benefits that you get are the anticipation of it coming and like the fact that it's it's on the way and that you can look forward to this thing. So like, look at the extra benefits that you're adding to someone's life by making them wait a month for your macarons. <laughs> um, is it a good idea to list your charities on your website? Absolutely. I think that um, your charities, your local partners, if you have ingredients, I think customers find that super interesting. And like, that could be maybe part of the story of like, you use honey, local honey instead of sugar or whatever, that's something that makes you special and different. Um, feel free to list that on your website. Um, or if you have some fun stats, uh, media always loves that. Like you have increased your sales by 95% this year, or you have baked X pies this year or whatever that might be. Um, you've raised this many dollars for a local charity. Um, I think that is fantastic to see. The streamlined little listy bullet point things on your website, awesome. Um, and that could even be something that you could share on social media for your fans too, of like, look what we did together, you know? Um, maybe that's like an Instagram reel or like one of your story highlights or something is like your charity work. Um, is it a, oh, rush fee is a great idea for someone who has a hard time saying no, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. It's like getting paid overtime. Mm -hmm. um, waiting can be okay. Definitely agree. And it, it makes you way more excited. And, and I think it's one of those things where you can make sure to deliver your best work and not feel resentful about it, right? Like there's been many stories that I've rushed through uh, because there's a deadline and I'm not going to miss that deadline. But then I turned it in and I'm like, oh, that really wasn't my best work. And, you know, you get over it, but you feel kind of like off. So I think it's kind of listening to your gut. Um, okay, Pie Bird. For us, talking about where we give is really important. We found that our customers respond well and are excited to be part of giving back to our community alongside us. And it's such a vital part of like your brand and business, right? So I think finding those causes that really align with you, um, and when I say be, be yourself and be open on social media, which I think Emily will also speak to this, you can do so without letting all of yourself out there. Like maybe find the things that you're comfortable sharing. You don't have to be like, oh guys, I got a flat tire today. Like my mom is going through this and that. And like, you can't believe what my kid did at school and he got a bloody nose. And like, we maybe don't need that much in, but maybe find the things that you're comfortable about. Maybe it's your, um, your environmental passion or something. Or for me, I'm super open about the fact that like I've had an eating disorder and like how food has really uh, been a, a struggle for me in the past. And now it's a really much a, a thing of joy. Um, but you find the things that you're comfortable about being vulnerable about and people connect with that or it's the causes that you're super passionate about and why. Um, and then people want to invest in you, in your story, in, and if they've ever been there, then they feel less alone, right? Like Kristen, we, we've chatted a little bit about the people who've come up to you at the farmer's market. Maybe it's parents of kids, maybe it's kids who, who are LGBTQ themselves. And they're just like, I, I did, I've never met anybody who's like me, you know? And God, what a difference that makes, you know? Or like, I've gotten emails from people who are like, I'm bulimic right now. And like seeing someone who's out there like eating and enjoying and having a life that gives me hope, you know, and uh, being yourself can make a larger difference than you think. Uh, just living your life, you know, kind of in alignment and with those goals that you set with Christina. So feel free to keep, keep the questions coming. I love these comments and questions. Um, Heading back to our list, um, goes without saying for this group, but treat your community with respect and like be a good human. There are certain people that like, I don't have many, but if I know that you don't treat your staff well, or uh, there are police reports of you beating your girlfriend or something like that, chances are I'm gonna try not to cover you because that is just like, it doesn't sit well with me. 
um, that we are supporting a business that is not supporting its community. So um, just be a good human. And I think that this group already has that covered. Um, be responsive and be you. So a lot of times I, I write emails to uh, website addresses or hop into somebody's DMs and I don't hear back which is challenging because I'm like, oh, I have this space open and I was thinking you would be the perfect person for it. But like, if I don't hear from you, I can't really cover you because um, I need to know that you're okay with me talking about you, A, and I want to make sure that I have all of the information correct. Um, so make sure that you keep a keen eye on things. It doesn't have to be the same day, but maybe within like the same week, if you're contacted by somebody, you can let them know. Or if you see the note and don't have time to reply right away, maybe just pop back and say, yes, I'm interested. I'm gonna get back in touch with you with answers or with a more thorough response in a week or something like that. Just be kind of open communication lines about whether you're game, whether you're not, if you have any parameters or things that you don't want us to talk about, um, that's awesome. Okay, what other questions do we have? Okay, Holly, do you think there is some hesitation about being misrepresented in the media? Ooh, absolutely. And that is the last thing that personally I want to see, and I know a lot of journalists want to see. We want your story to be told in a way that is fair, is accurate. Um, is there a way from our journalist end that we can help clear that up for you? Like, I, I try to um, be very open about timing so that you know when to prepare for additional orders, about the questions that I am going to cover, um, try to steer clear of any sensitive topics. But I know that this is you, this is your brand, and like having this published in front of thousands or millions of people can be scary. So, so I'd love to hear from you guys, what would make that a more comfortable experience for you? Mm. Yeah, that's very true. I hear um, many comments about the media as like a whole and uh, fake news and like misinformation and um, just mistakes because a lot of people aren't paid very much and they just have to rush like we've been talking about and they have a lot of deadlines in a day. Um, but the great thing at least about digital media is that that can be fixed. Um, I, I will say that I'm far from flawless and I have made a mistake or I've mixed up a date or something along those lines and we can fix that in the digital media space very easily within seconds. Um, and newspapers can print corrections. Um, but I think just being open and honest and, and uh, answering all the questions with your own words, um, we can't put words in your mouth. So I think the only, the wiggle room would be in the narrative of the story. And um, some brands do let you proof it. A lot of brands just say it's against policy for us to share the copy before it's published. Um, or I know that news places don't, TV news or radio news don't really have the availability to do that quite so easily. Um, but you can often ask at least to look over the quotes that will be printed. So if you would like to see the direct quotes, like that is 100%, I think I'm comfortable always sharing that part. Um, even if, you know, it, like we can't share the rest of the piece, like what you said is what you said. And we want to make sure that that is correct and accurate. Um, so that would be the, if you would be comfortable asking to see the quotes that would be printed, I think that would be more than fair. And again, the worst that they can do is say no when you ask, right? I know every company has a bit of a different policy, but what other questions do we have? Are there any dream publications that you guys would like to be covered in? That's another great thing to think about when you're getting coverage in media is who could maybe be the connection to that publication? Because I think getting that, that connect, the personal introduction from someone is super helpful. 
Um, so maybe I might know somebody who works at your dream publication or, you know, another journalist or a friend of a friend happened to go to college with the food editor at Bon Appetit or something like that. Um, thinking through your, your mental Rolodex of your connections and how you can get in a little bit closer. Cherry bomb. Oh my gosh. Did you see that their Jubilee is happening, Chelsea? Um, so Cherry Bomb is fantastic. They also have a podcast, which would be super cool to be published or like interviewed on. Um, that's a great one. I know that their website has a lot of places where you can like kind of submit your brand or your story idea, um, which, you know, is a shot in the dark, but it certainly can't hurt. Uh, oh, I do love that brand. JT on her pot. Oh, Julia Tertian. She is incredible. Um, if you guys have not listened to her podcast, Keep Calm and Cook On, she also has a new cookbook. Um, she's a person who really excels at kind of like social justice and like body positivity within the, the cookbook space. So um, I think that would be a really good alignment. Yeah. Um, it was BA until they had their issues last summer. Yep. Um, I think their new editor is really making it turn a corner. I also had like right for BA on my bucket list and swapped that out for a different item after what happened last summer. Um, but I think, I think they are turning a corner. Marcus Samuelson is like their editor, their overviewing editor, and they're showcasing a lot more diversity. I think honestly, as, as tough as this is to admit as a member of the media, I think it, there are, there are problems within many companies that, that could be a lot better within um, accessibility and, and social and LGBTQ and racial justice and all of these things. Um, so yeah, it's, it's like humans. We all have like a little bit of things that we could improve upon. Um, covering the gray line between business page and personal. Ooh, yes. If ranting on a personal page and blurred to business. Yes. Um, I actually saw this recently with somebody who has like a food business and on their personal page, they were talking about their mask beliefs and signing up for events related to anti-vaccine things. And then that came out and it impacted the way that people thought about their business. And that does get to be really tricky territory, right? So I think, again, it kind of um, dips into the topic of being in alignment and um, making your brand part of part of your person, but not your person, but having those things line up with who you are. Like, um, I, I think having your brand page separate from your personal page can be very, very helpful when you are a food business. Um, while showing yourself a little bit on your food business, but you can't just not be that person that you are at home, right? So I think, uh, ranting about politics and stuff like that is never a good thing on social media. Um, I try to keep kind of politics a, a little bit away from that, but um, I think it's a matter of you kind of, it's a sliding boundary, right? Some people don't want to show their kids on their social media or don't want to show their kids on their business page. So it's kind of like what you're comfortable with, but um, I, I would say the family stuff and everything for the majority would be on your personal page. Maybe they show up every so often on your business page just as like a little highlight, but it's more about you, the product, the story behind it, your partners, stuff like that. Um, and I think never, ever, ever talk bad about your customers or, or clients on either page or um, try to keep it a level head and think of like, will I regret this if I do this later? Like I've had many um, pretty public reviews of me as a human and other things of, of things that I've written about. And I think through like, should I reply? Should I post something? And what I often come back to is like, nothing really good is gonna come from this if I get heated about it. I'm just gonna kind of keep my peace and like it'll blow over. Um, so I think that is often a great way to deal with a lot of controversies unless you you making a statement or or confronting someone or whatever would make it 
more at peace with you. Um, love the New York Times cooking page. That would be epic. Uh-huh. Samin Nosrat, Mark Bittman, so good. Um, DSM Magazine, love to see it. Um, Bloody Berry Mix is a berry craft project. <gasps> so fun. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. I love to hear about that, Joe. Um, yeah, that would make like a cool video or something for a brand to come visit you and see how that's made. Or, you know, maybe it's part of, maybe you could pitch that as part of like, hey, it's tailgate season. This Bloody Mary mix would be an awesome addition to people's tailgates. Like we could, we could set up a video interview outside at like the next Iowa State game or something and I could show you how to make this or we could, you know, use this Bloody Mary mix to make a trendy Bloody Mary popsicle or something like that, you know, like come up with some sort of using a local vodka brand or something like that. Um, I love that idea. Yeah, that would be super cool for, for something local or even like, you know, Midwest Living might be so interested in something kind of like that because it's a Midwest brand but they cover a lot of like kind of trend food, food trends. And I know that they've reached out to me about their holiday gift guide, which is another thing that you guys would be awesome for coming up. Um, pitch your stuff, especially if it's more shelf stable or if it's packageable and giftable and sendable um, for holiday gift guides. Every brand does them. So the, the thing that I'm having trouble with is uh, finding the licensing as far as, you know, smoking the tomatoes at home and then taking them to a commercial kitchen and processing mm. them there. So I'm trying to work with like a local barbecue place yeah. to see if they could, you know, smoke my tomatoes and then, then I can take them as a, a an ingredient, like a finalized ingredient. Um, but I'm, I'm hopefully going to uh, be canning it, putting it in 12 ounce cans and selling it as four packs. So I think that's a great idea. And then maybe you can sell it there too, like at the restaurant on yeah. there as a menu item or something like that. Oh. So I, I just purchased this uh, old school trailer with a, a built-in cooler that I'm going to revamp and uh, have my whole theme is like piracy. So it's, it's called mutiny, bloody mix and sauce. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> So uh, I, I'm, I'm going to take this cart and I'm going to put old wooden barrels on it so I can sit on there and just serve right out of the, the cooler. And yeah, so. This all sounds very Instagrammable. I love yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish I was better at that kind of stuff, but. <laughs> hey, that's all right. It's something that just takes a little practice, right? Like if you scroll through any of our Instagram accounts to back to like 2015, I'm sure there's some photos and stuff that we aren't too proud of, right? right. So yeah. <laughs> you get better with time at a lot of things and it's just like you learn by doing or you can hire stuff out if you're not super comfortable with doing it. But I think having someone distinctly involved with your brand is a really, it makes it much more personal when you're able to tell those stories and, and why you decided on this awesome pirate theme and stuff like that, right? Okay, I had someone post about my pricing once on my Facebook business page and I just deleted it, not worth commenting on. Um, one pro tip, you can hide comments without deleting them so they don't know that they are deleted um, if you don't want it to be public, right? So like I used to run the social media for Better Homes and Gardens and people would say something nasty about, you know, one of our editors or that is such an ugly comforter or something like that. And it's just bringing the mood down or they use curse words or whatever. You can click on that triple dot thing and hide it. They will never know. Um, they still see it as live, but you don't have to comment on it. Nobody else will see it. Um, I also had a lady comment on my pricing at farmer's market too. Disheartening as I struggle with pricing. Yep. Um, yeah, you have to choose a price that works for you, right? And if, if you have a lot of customers who are very willing to pay that price, um, then it's clearly a fair one. Um, and it's, it's also your time and effort. And I think that might be another thing that you can kind of cover on your, your social media or your website of like, here's how much labor that goes into this, you know, like, I often think of that when setting my own rates too, because I own my own business, right? And like a lot of people who work at large companies maybe don't think of the fact that your insurance 
or for a place that has a brick and mortar like Krem, your your rent, your in, building insurance, your heating and air conditioning, your electricity bill, your water bill, your garbage, your everything, like all of this is wrapped into that menu price, right? And so like when you create a product, you're needing to cover your time, your childcare, maybe your, all of your like home things, all of your equipment, your ingredients, like all of that, that goes into this product. Um, and, you know, you don't have to be negative about it, but maybe you can be like, you know, give us a little infographic about like how much work goes into each cookie or something, or like, this is a four hour process and here's what that timeline looks like to make that macaroon or this time-lapse cake is actually, you know, 10 seconds sped up from six hours of my life making this drip cake with macaroons like sprinkled down the side or something like that. Like we want to know that. And like when people see that, then I think it's really valid. I did see, yeah, someone else comment about like, oh, I can't believe you paid $300 for your kid's first birthday smash cake. I think everybody has different definitions of value and um, what they're willing to invest in. But it's clear, I think, if you've made it this far, and you can listen to your gut of whether you need to adjust or maybe offer an occasional sale to make your product accessible to a wider group of people, or maybe it's just right, you know? Like there are a lot of dinner places that my parents think it's silly that I go to because they're like, wow, that's too expensive. Like I'd rather spend my money on X, Y, and Z. But to me, that is like my favorite way to spend my money, you know, food and travel. And so like, I'm very happy to invest in a higher price point dinner experience because like that's entertainment to me. And I also know how much work and, and care goes into that. And like, I'm very happy to pay for something that's a little bit different from, you know, the Applebee's that they might choose instead. Um, so I think it's, it's about, again, listening to your gut, but um, yeah, don't, don't let them get you down about your pricing. I think as long as it's, it's comfortable with you and within line of, you know, the general market trends here locally, you're just fine. And a lot of work and other things to go into that than, you know, the typical store-bought product. All right, I think we have about five more minutes. What other questions do you guys have for me? This has been a great conversation. Can I jump in real quick, Carla? I, I feel just a back that I was gonna type it out, but it's getting very long. I feel like the media looks for the unique higher end products. They're never looking to write a story on something because it's the cheapest price. Mm -hmm. So words like craft, artisan, new to the market. Um, Joe, I think of you with your smoked tomatoes, like, you know, that's a whole nother step in the process. And I was putting in there like Oprah's favorite things. Oprah's never picked anything off a of price. She didn't care what the price is. It could be yeah. a, a blanket that is the same as the $10 blanket, but on her list, it might be 60 because it's made by a woman owned business. Yeah. So I don't think the media is ever going to worry about uh, price. So charge what you're worth supply and demand, you know, if, if, and Chelsea's hidden right now, but she knows this, right? I mean, she drives home that she knows she's going to make this much and she's going to sell it for top dollar. So I always give the example, do you want to make, you know, 200 cakes priced at $10 or, you know, do you want to make five cakes priced at $500, you know, think about that method. So I, I always get very defensive for my small businesses when somebody's breaking them down on price. So I'm sorry that happened, but check them off and go to the next customer because there are people out there that will pay you what you're worth. That is so true. So true. And I've had that happen in the writing space too. You know, this year has been all about working smarter, not harder. And you can satisfy clients who will pay you, your rate that you deserve and also have a lot more free time if you charge what you're worth, you know? Um, and, and like you said, Christina, the, um, those gift guides and those roundups and stuff, you can tailor your pitch and product to be perfect for something like that by, um, digging up something. This is what PR reps often do for like large national companies, right? So 
tailoring your product to a specific trend. So maybe there's some sort of a food trend report, Joe, that you can find about how smoking is one of the biggest food trends of 2022. Look, it's popping over here. It's showing up in this other company. Here's this local brand that's doing it. Or maybe, you know, I got an invite to an event where um, this popular blogger is showing us how to make a charcuterie board with this like biltong or something, you know, it's like a jerky type product, but instead of prosciutto, they're going to send us a bunch of cheeses and we're going to make this charcuterie board. And like all these influencers and media folks will show off this charcuterie board, which of course is very still social media trendy using this biltong product. So maybe there's some sort of trend that you can showcase and like, it's, it's curated, it's trendy, it's, artisan, like Christina was saying, it's not cheap. It's not, you know, sometimes we do budget friendly roundups. And if it's totally out of the, the purview, like I'm probably not going to showcase like, you know, Louis Vuitton bag or <laughs> something like that. But you know, if it's in the wheelhouse, like price point pretty much doesn't matter. Um, and it, also it's up to customers to decide what they're willing to pay. That's not my call as like a journalist, you know, and like clearly, like you have a lot of fans if you've made it this far. Okay, what local publications would you recommend us looking into? Still pretty new. Um, okay, Axios has a daily newsletter. Um, Lynn and, oh gosh, what is the gentleman's name who helps with that? Jason, yes, exactly. Um, they cover news every day. Um, the Des Moines Register, DSM Magazine. We also have a statewide sister publication called IA Magazine. Any of the local news, TV news stations, especially like the morning shows or the like noon coverage tends to be kind of more lifestyle-y. Um, I would say even maybe Iowa Public Radio or if there's a specific podcast that you love to listen to that might have some either just like good storytelling for you and your brand outreach or some customers that might align if you ship nationally. Um, let's see, what didn't I cover? Um, City View covers food. Um, I'm sure other like regional newspapers, Midwest Living covers Iowa. Um, and then any sort of like websites that you think might be interested. There's a lot of like apps out there. Catch Des Moines does some coverage. The partnership does some coverage. Um, so maybe it's even like looking into local nonprofits that support business. Um, Axios DSM. Yeah, they share stuff about local food almost every day. Hello, Iowa on Channel 13. Alyssa, you've been such a rock star on there. I still remember what you made like these palmiers on there one time and I still like, I need to make those. Those look delicious. Um, but Question yeah, to things. Alyssa on that. We've had other people reach out saying hello, Iowa charges them to be on that show. So it depends on what your pitch is. If it's, um, if you're pretty much just coming in and saying like, I just make this random thing, then it's like, then they'll charge you. Um, but if you come in with like a really unique pitch, sometimes you can kind of get around that paywall a little bit. Um, and if you get to the right people. So it's almost like an advertorial or something. Or yeah, like they, mm -hmm. adver yeah. <laughs> they, I mean, if I were to come in and say like, I'm, like I've said, like, well, I make macarons and they're like, well, like you can pay to advertise for your macarons. And so you kind of have to get a little bit more unique about it. I came in, I got in because Aaron Kiernan wanted me to do a sports thing with them. And so I did a couple sports things with them and they were like, oh, but you also do baking. So let's like pivot a little bit because I think people are more interested in the baking. So you have to get a little bit creative, I think, with them to get in. <laughs> And that's another great thing to think about of like extensions, right? Like I've interviewed some of you for our digital space, but our print magazine goes to, you know, 10 times as many people. Um, so maybe if I reach out to you about an online thing or the register does about a, a digital publication, maybe you can say like, hey, I've seen that you guys do this feature in the print magazine called Snag the Recipe while we're chatting. like could we line something up for the print or like, could I pitch ideas for the future for the print section? Like, it looks like you cover this area. I could help with that. Um, or thinking through like, Hey, we've talked about sports, but also I have this thing. Um, once you have that relationship built, maybe think about like future synergies that you guys can team up on. 
Awesome. Well, we are going to wrap up this uh, session, everyone. Um, Carla did drop her email in there and she always loves stories ideas. So help her <laughs> help her out. Her email is in there. Um, Carla, thanks for being with us today. I know this has been a tremendous session and there's so many great stories to tell with all these people on here today. So again, you've learned some highlights of how to get your story out there. And Carla is right here again in Des Moines and writes for these national publications. And she mentioned she's a good connector. So if there's something you wanna be in, feel free to reach out to her. We're gonna take a quick 10 minute break. Um, Emily has joined us. I'm gonna make sure we get her mic checked and her, her share screen. So feel free to take a 10 minute break and we'll be back at uh, 1020 sharp. Thank you everybody.